And we're going to talk about the stewardship of our talents. The stewardship of our talents. So take your Bibles and let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And people are looking and they're saying, Pastor Phil's got his bag up there. So there's no telling what he is going to do this morning. Well, the sermon's so long I thought I needed a lunch this morning. And so I, uh, no, just kidding. Uh, but we are, we are going to have a good time here and uh, illustrate something that I think will really drive home the truth this morning. So we began this three-week study last week. I'm calling it this, Managing God's Investment. And this is what we are doing, to be honest. It all began in the Garden of Eden when Adam was put there to manage and to work the garden. He was to have dominion over plants, trees, animals, resources, produce, and just about anything you can name on this old sphere we call earth. Most importantly, he was to manage himself and obey the commands that God gave him to do. God was the owner, Adam was the manager, and it hasn't changed today, friends. God still owns everything, and we are still charged to be the managers of God's property. Last week, I spent a great deal of time talking about our time, and I said that we need to be stewards of our time. And I want to thank you for your response. I was encouraged by many regarding that sermon that it, uh, that it helped you. And I praise the Lord for that. And I pray that today will be equally as beneficial for the entire body. Now this week, we're going to be talking about talents. And I'm not going to be talking about talents. That is the talents of money, which is what Matthew 25 talks about. But rather, I'm going to be talking about the gifts and talents that the Holy Spirit brought to us, gave us on the day that we said yes to Jesus. Best thing to do is to read the passage. So let's stand together. <clears throat> Everybody stand. And we're going to read Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 8. If you're our guest, we do this. We stand in honor of the word, and then we read out loud together. Why? Well, we read it, we hear it, we see it on the page. It's a triple emphasis of the Word of God. And folks, I don't know about you and don't know where you came from today, but we here at Grace Church believe this is the Word of God. Amen? We believe that God has given us His Word and that the best we can do is to preach it, teach it, understand it, and apply it. So let's read. The words are on the screen. Let's read it together beginning now. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another." Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness." Father, add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word this morning. I pray, Father, that you would, uh, you would meld and weld us into the, to the body that you want us to be for the glory of your name and for the salvation of the lost and the building up of the saved. Help us as we study and preach and teach in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, I'm only going to emphasize verses 3 through 8 this morning in that rather rapidly. I actually want to get to an illustration that I think will really help you and help you understand this passage. Now, we're covering very familiar territory this morning. Uh, it's familiar territory, but poorly applied. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean poorly applied? Well, we have a habit. That is, we have the habit of thinking that to study a subject is to perform the subject. 
to study prayer. I think I want to learn how to be a real prayer warrior. All right, let's study prayer. So we study, 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 have meetings and conferences, and, but we don't ever really begin to pray. It's not until you say, Lord, I need to talk to you that you begin praying. And so it's the doing of the thing. And this, uh, we could talk about swimming. We could say, well, I want to learn to swim. So we study six weeks on how to swim, but we never jump in the water. Folks, you're not getting to the other side of the creek until you jump in and swim. And so this is the way it is. This is what we're talking about. We want to apply the teaching of the Word of God. So I'll briefly cover the high points of verses 3 through 8, all based on verses 1 and 2, present your bodies a living sacrifice. But I'm going to emphasize verses 3 through 8, and I'm going to talk to you about employing our gifts, our talents, our abilities, uh, our equipping by God. By the way, to talk about spiritual gifts, there are two fours and two twelves. You say, what, 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 two fours and two twelves? Well, there are two, two chapter fours and two chapter twelves. If you want to read about it today and find out what the Bible says about spiritual gifts, read Ephesians chapter four, read 1 Peter chapter four, and then two twelves. Read Romans chapter 12 and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Two fours and two twelves. Now, I want us to remember at the outset to be called a servant or to even be called a doulos, a slave, to be called that in the Bible is not a negative, it's a positive. In fact, um, you are associating with the highest level people whenever you become the servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Mark 10, 45, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said it another way in Luke 22. He, for who is greater? He's speaking to some guys there, some Pharisees and others. Who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? According to the culture, is it not he who sits at the table? But according to me, am I among you as one who serves? I am one who serves. The greatest is the servant. So we're talking today about our service in the body of Christ, the local church, the ecclesia. We are blessed today to be a part of the universal church, the church with a capital C. There are people who have met or are meeting today all over the world who are speaking different language, languages, who are living in different cultures and who are doing things and their church services would not resemble our church services at all, but they are born again children of God. They love God. And you know what? They're our brothers and sisters in Christ and I love them and we're going to meet with them one day and live with them forever. Amen. Amen. It's all over the world. But this passage, and what I'm talking about is the ecclesia, the local assembly of believers. And that's what we're talking about. Many amazing, we have many amazing and wonderful servants among us here at Grace Church. Uh, some are doing too much, to be honest. Uh, I come in here on a Wednesday night and see all the things that are going on. Everything from a meal that's prepared to the Awana classes and the many, many events that go on to the youth ministries, to various adults, uh, thing, ministries that are going on to musicians. It's an amazing, amazing, uh, beautiful harmony that I see. But the truth is, is that I want to invite everyone to be on God's team in the local assembly because this is the plan of God. Now, we just read the passage, and let me give you some high points. The first thing that Paul says we need to consider is concerning our gifts, our abilities, our talents, is we need to, one, watch our pride. Watch your pride. Watch your pride. Pride's always a problem. You say, why is that? Well, because I is in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, Paul says to everyone who is among you, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to everybody. And it's a, it's a challenge for everyone at some point in life to look around and think, well, I'm just a little bit better than anybody else. Pride is a problem. Have you ever heard of the wide mouth frog? Well, there was this frog. And uh, he was very boisterous and he always was bragging and talking about what he could do. And so he slipped up between the ducks one day and he was in the pond and he slipped up between the ducks. He says, you ducks are nothing. You think you can swim? I've been swimming all around under your feet. I can swim better than any one of you. And one of the ducks wisely said to him, said, well, can you fly? Well, if a frog could grit teeth, he gritted his teeth and he would have just been thinking about that. I can't fly. I can't. Oh, I have an idea. I think I can fly. And he found a popsicle stick and he told two ducks, look, you put this in in your beak. You put this in in your beak. I'm going to hold on in the middle and off we'll go. I'll be able to fly. 
And so the ducks were on the pond and they looked up and lo and behold, there was the wide mouthed frog holding onto the popsicle stick in between the two ducks beaks. And there he was soaring through the heavens. And that duck says, well, man, old wide mouthed frog, he really can fly. Look at, I wonder where he got that idea. Who thought that up? And the wide mouthed frog said, I did. Pride. There's dangers to avoid with our gifting. The first one is self-deception. Paul talked about it. Don't think too highly of yourself. Paul has in mind those people who tend to look down on other believers. They think, well, I'm more holy, I'm more able, I'm more capable than other people. And they might even think I am God's gift to the church. And uh, some people actually live like that. They act as if if their talents and their abilities were removed from the life of the church, it would just cease Uh, The Bible talks about a guy like that named Diotrephes, and John wrote about him and warned about him. Some have forgotten this, that the church existed before they did and will continue to exist after they're gone. And folks, every believer is important, but none is absolutely essential. I am not essential to the continuance of this church. Jesus is essential to the continuance of this church. Amen. And we need to give ourselves as believers while we're here to the body of believers. And that's, there's a place in the work of God for all the redeemed, but the whole work of God doesn't rest on the shoulders of any single person, only on Jesus and his spirit. There's another problem and that is self-deprecation. Self-deprecation. What is that? Well, it's criticize yourself or minimize yourself or to think what you can do isn't that important. Uh, They think little of themselves. There are people Uh, who are asked to do something in the church from time to time. They say, well, I can't do it. I don't have any prep. I I haven't studied that. I don't have any talents or ability. No, no, I just, I'm just not able. I just can't do anything. Well, if you're saved, then there is something that you can do in the body of Christ. Why, Why do you say that? Because 1 Corinthians 12, 7 said that a measure of grace and a measure of faith has been given regarding gifts to every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I sound like I'm going to contradict myself, but I'm not. A moment ago, I said some people think that they're just God's gift to the church. Now, I'm going to say it this way. Let me tell you with a different tone, you are God's gift to the church. You say, well, how does that work? Well, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 said that he gave some apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists and so on, and he gave them to the church so that the church could be built up and do the work that God had given them to do. So they were gifted people that were given to the church. So here's the Bible teaching. Every person in the room, when you said yes to Jesus, you were further equipped by the Holy Spirit to do something beyond what was your normal ability. Now, this is not to diminish normal talents. God can use those too. But sometimes there's a spiritual additional gift, not sometimes, every time he gives us something additional that we can do. And God wants us to use that. People try to downplay that. But you're God's gift to the church. That is, the Lord will use you in a mighty way. Sometimes when people hear about uh, people being used, they just sort of, you know, because they're self-deprecating and they get complimented, they shrug it off. God really used them in an amazing way. And they say, oh, it wasn't anything. This is false humility, folks. And you're robbing God of his glory not to say, hey, man, I'm just thankful that God was able to use me because he was and he does. Here's something else we need to do. We need to decide to accept our gifting. Between these thoughts... Uh, is the balance that we should strive for. And Paul talks about, he says it this way in that verse, Paul calls on us to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now he's not talking about not in drunkenness. That's not what he means. He means we are to think soberly, that is sanely, intelligently, and realistically, and accept the fact that God has gifted you. There's not a person in the room that claims that if you congregate here and these are your people, then God has given you gifts because he saved you. And those gifts are a gift to the local body of believers. And if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, you matter. You're important. What you bring to the body is vital. And if you don't do it, it's not going to be done. You matter. You're important. You know what? In the world, you're a number and you're unimportant. But in the church, you're a son of God and you are important. It's so important for us to understand this. Get rid of this idea of I don't matter. Accept the fact, accept the truth that your gift is not for you, but for the whole body. Accept the reality 
that what God has gifted you to do is needed. And I can just say with all honesty and, and all faith in what the word of God says, if you have come to us and you're a believer in Jesus and you're a participant here, it's because we need you. We just need to find out what it is that God equipped you to do. You need to find out, I need to find out, and we need to help you and we need to help one another. Accept the reality. Moses, whenever the Lord tapped him on the shoulder, said, send somebody else. Gideon, when the Lord tapped him on the shoulder, said, well, look, I'm, I'm just so small and I'm from the smallest family and unimportant people. Saul, head and shoulders among the people. When the Lord tapped him on the shoulder, what did he do? He went and hid among the baggage. He just disappeared. It's not supposed to be that way. Accept the reality. And then next, discover the grace of God in your gifting. Discover the grace of God. It's all of grace. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Don't lose sight of Paul's use of that word grace. Look at verse number three. For I say through the grace that was given to me to everyone who is among you. Then look at verse six. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us. Use them and so on. And so the whole point is, is that everything is of grace. It's so important for us to understand. The first truth is this. Everybody is saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Folks, it's not a performance-based situation. You don't earn your way into God's good favor. You don't perform. You don't give. You don't turn over a new leaf. No, no, no. All you do is bring your sin to Jesus and receive his forgiveness and his redemption and follow him with all of your heart. But it's not, say, we're saved by God's good favor. And then here's the important thing. We're also serving by grace. Saved by grace, we're serving by grace. Here's what Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15, 11. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And what gifts we have were not given to us so that we could exalt ourselves, of course, but given so that we could serve others in the body. Again, I repeat, you are important. You matter. God has gifted you in the body of believers. Second point, write it down quickly. Take your place. Verse four and five, take your place. All right. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So you need to understand the illustration. Paul draws our attention to the human body as an illustration. At the end today, I'm going to use this illustration a little more specifically. The human, the human body is a simple illustration. We've got hands and feet and mouth, ears, nose, and some people have hair. I mean, it's wonderful. And, and, and you know, so that, that's the human body. So our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. There's over 200 bones. There are over 600 muscles. And there's specialized systems that I can't even name that help us to live and function. The body is diverse, but it is a perfect picture of unity. No part in the body tries to function the part of another. Every part simply does its function and the entire body benefits and the entire body collaborates. And I, I for one, am glad that my hands do not go on strike when I sit for supper, aren't you? I mean, what if the hand, I sit down for supper and says, not today, pal. I mean, <laughs> it just wouldn't work, would it? Or if I need to get somewhere and the feet say no or legs or whatever. It's a simple illustration, but the body's not simple. Think about this. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 139 that we, the creatures of God, humanity is fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, how wonderful is it? Well, there's over 7.5 trillion cells in your body. Uh, each one more complex than the most advanced computer. Each cell has a tiny group of atoms called protein molecules, and the largest molecule is called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And it carries the hereditary information from parents to offspring, and it also carries a genetic code, and it determines what you're going to be. We can read your DNA and find out what you are. In other words, it determines whether you're a man or a mammoth. I mean, there's just, I mean your DNA tells what you are. It's amazing. And so uh, a DNA, the DNA in one cell is about six feet long. Total DNA in the body, all of your cells would fit in, a, in, a, in an ice cube. But if you were to put them, join them together end to end and stretch it out, your DNA would reach to the sun and back 400 times. Complex. All of our cells contain information found in all the other cells. Every cell in your body carries all the necessary information for another you. So, you know, if you got psoriasis and you're flaking off all that, you know, you know what happens when you got psoriasis and you flake that off. Every one of those flakes has got all the information necessary to make another you. How about that? 
a matter of fact, there's lots more in each flake than you really need. So here's the deal. If the coded DNA information and instructions of one human were translated into English, it would fill a thousand volume encyclopedia. You know, the cells divide and they continually divide. In cell division, the cell forms a rotating double helix, which I could have shown in your picture, but you've probably seen it before, this thing with all these little connections. It rotates at 75 turns per second. If this room, this auditorium, were filled with microphone cables from the floor to the ceiling and we were trying to sort them out, well, you could give that job to the double helix and it could sort out every one in a split second. The cell's duplication, the replication of the cells is so accurate it is so incredibly accurate that it is not in error in more than one letter in what would be in an entire Encyclopedia Britannica. Don't tell me there's not a God in heaven that created everything. He did create everything and he maintains everything. The cell's duplication is that way. Now God's made something pretty amazing in the human body. But Paul talks about the more obvious things and he uses this as an illustration. What he wants us to do is understand this. Understand the individual nature of our gifting. That's verse 4 in the second part. We are saved individually and we are gifted by God individually. And we are special to God as individual persons. Let's never be ashamed of who we are as an individual in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are important as an individual. But by the way, there's no household salvation, there's no community or cultural salvation, there's not national salvation. There is only individual faith and trust in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today, if you've never called on Jesus to be your Savior, I pray that you would do, do that and call on Him as He reaches out to you before you even leave the room. But having been born again, through the washing and regeneration of the blood and the Holy Spirit in our life, we should never be ashamed of who we are as an individual in the body of Christ. He loved you. He died for you. He has gifted you according to his will. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of everyone, but the one in the selfsame Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. I'd like to have the gift that so-and-so has not going to happen because God made his decision. God gifted you the way he wanted to gift you. He needed you the way you are. That person that you look at in the mirror and either comb the hair or shave the face or whatever you do in the morning, that person with all their gifting is created by God. And if you're a born again believer, that person is equipped for the local body of believers. We need to understand the integration of the body. Verse 5. While the body is made up of many components, they all function together amazingly. When my eyes see something and wants to investigate, my hand responds by reaching out and lifting the object so I can. When I want to move from one location to another, my feet and my legs respond by moving in that direction. There's unity and we're moving together. And remember now, this is an illustration of the body of Christ, a church. There is wonderful integration, cooperation, and collaboration. The unity within the human body is amazing. And it's supposed to be the way it is in the body of the Christ. Now, Paul used some really funny illustrations in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. People say, well, I find the Bible very drab and there's never even a light moment. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul talks about what if the body was nothing but a mouth? What if the body was nothing but an eye? Look up there. What if the body was nothing but a mouth? That's it. There's the church. It's just a mouth. Or what if our body was like that? It's just a mouth. Next. What if our body was just an ear? That's all you are. You can hear, but you can't do anything else. Next. Do you know that that eye is 31 feet high and it's in front of a building in Dallas, Texas, and you can actually go visit that thing? That's like a sightseeing thing. It's an eye. Well, what if, the, what if our body was that? Next. Could be a nose, smelling everything. Next. What if our body was nothing but feet? Now, that's a nice looking set of feet there. I wish my feet still looked like that. You don't want my shoes off because they're not. Anyway, what if we were just feet? Anything else up there? Go ahead. How about hands? I'm just a hand. Nothing else. I think that's the last one. You get the picture. So never let it be said <laughs> Paul didn't have a sense of humor. I'm not, the, 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 uh, this body is nothing but, it, it is more than an eye, an ear, a foot, because each part does its part. Now, my, my, my hand needs my eye to know how to grab my fork, know where it is. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's the way, it, all of it works together. And it's a simple illustration 
And we need to understand the integration of the body of Christ. And our human bodies are the example. Every part has a duty. They all come together for the good of the whole. None are unimportant. None should ever be left out. And the body of Christ is no different. Every one of us has been gifted. And let me just say it again, loud and clear. You're here. God brought you. He gifted you. And we need it. We need you. We need your gift. So do what God has gifted you to do. Leave others to do what God has gifted them to do. Don't be jealous of the grace of God that has produced some gift in some other believer. Be thankful for the grace of God that has produced the gift in you. Finally, give your best. Verses 6 to 8. Give your best. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we discover our gifts. Discover them. If I had to give you a piece of paper this morning and I would tell you to write down on that page, these are the ways that God has gifted me. I've got got an ability here and there. Discover them. You say, well, I don't know what they are. Well, we're going to talk about this later in the announcements, but you can go to your app and there's a survey. And if you haven't taken that survey in a while, you go to the announcement section, look for survey of spiritual gifts. You can take that. That's one way to do it, but there's another way. Another way is, is to, according to what really piques your interest and according to where you think you might serve, dive in. Dive in. You know what you can do? You find out you're serving in the area you're not supposed to serve, you can find that out in a hurry if you actually get busy doing something. But you know, I've been in the ministry a very long time and I can't tell you how many people get involved and before you know it, they're thriving and God is using them amazingly. So discover your gift and then next use your gifts. Look at verse number six. It says, having then gifts according to the grace that God has given to us, that key on having then, in other words, we have them. Then let us use them. If prophecy, prophesy in proportion to faith or ministry or teaching or exhortation or giving or leading or showing cheerfulness, all of those things. And and by the way, these these are categorical. I don't believe they're a full list. In fact, I I won't argue argue in a in a theological debate, but the four, even the four chapters that I told you earlier give all kinds of all kinds of categories of gifts and so on. So very important. Use your gift. Now there it was a handout when you came in this morning back there, the same place you picked up your sheet, and on that handout are all kinds of areas of ministry that go on here at Grace Church. And Denise got these ready for us. And uh, I'd like you to pick one of those up. Now that doesn't have every little job that goes on here at the church listed there. I mean, turning on and off light switches, that's not mentioned in there. But I mean, there's all kinds of needs, all kinds of opportunities. And there's the contact name of the person that you can talk to. You say, well, I don't know exactly what my spiritual gift is. And I've taken those surveys before, but it really hadn't led me anywhere. I would just like to get started. Wonderful. Call that person, say, here I am, what can I do? And they will get you involved. And so use your gifts. And then letter C, bless and be blessed in the use of your gifts. Bless and be blessed. I can't tell you the, the joy that comes in, somebody, in, in, in a person's heart when they finally discover and they plug into the place where God is using them and to know that God is using them. There is a joy. You are, you are blessing others and you're being blessed. All of the gifts listed in any of the passages fall under two main headings. They fall under expounding the word of God. That is some sort of speaking, teaching, uh, uh, discipling with the word of God or expanding the work of God, all the missions of mercy and compassion and the hands that help and all of those things, expounding the word, expanding the word. So the last part of verse eight, I want to emphasize it deals with our attitude as we use the gifts that we have been given. Paul says the gifts are to be used, and he uses three words, liberality and diligence and cheerfulness. And I want to touch on those words quickly. The first word is the word liberality, liberality. In some versions, it's actually translated simplicity, and it is a major use of that Greek word. Simplicity. It means sincerity, free from pretense, uh, free from hypocrisy, and no sense of manipulation. Any exercise of our spiritual gift must be done with a pure heart. We minister for Jesus without thoughts of self. We serve him for his glory, not for personal gain. It's simple. We're not supposed to get involved and serve for the purpose of getting what we want. Next is diligence. The word means with haste or eagerness, giving your best. 
It refers to seeing the urgency of the moment and reaching out in the best of our ability to make a difference in the lives of other people while there is still time. Folks, I still, I still believe with all my heart that the great missionary plan of God is the local New Testament church. That's how God reaches. He brings a nest together, a nest, a, a home base where people come and they are built up and they're trained and they're discipled and they learn. And then every day we go out into our mission field and we spread the good news of the gospel but we have to be diligent about it. It's not just hoping it happens. It has to be intentional. We need to help make it happen. Cheerfulness. This is the last word I want to look at. And this word means with quality of cheerfulness or dispelling the gloom. Boy, there's a lot of gloomy news going on in the world today. A lot of gloomy atmospheres. Well, Christians ought to be the one that, that are dispelling the gloominess and do what we do with cheerfulness. And we get our English word hilarious from the Greek word that is used here. The idea is to serve God from an excited heart. Go to church because you want to. Share Jesus because you want to. Serve Jesus according to your giftedness because you were excited about it because of who God made you to be. Now, I've looked at the details a little bit. I've just sort of hit the high points, talked about this whole thing, but I, I want to emphasize the simplicity of the illustration. That is, he says that the local New Testament church ought to function like a human body. They ought to, the, 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 I mean, every part doing its part. You can go to the Ephesians passage and find out that a perfect man or a completely mature man or woman is one where all the parts do their part. And he's talking about the church. It is so very important. So I've got a little something here in my bag of tricks and I want brother Mark to come up. Mark, I asked Mark this morning or last night or yesterday or some point to help me with this illustration. So everything I do to him, I have permission. I just want y'all to know this morning. Okay. I've already done this once. So Mark, how you doing? Good. Good. He's highly qualified for this. Do you, are you got all your fingers and hands working? All right. Can you do this and stuff? Legs. I mean, you could, if I, if you had to, and I told you to see how fast you could run around a room, you could go up and down all these aisles and you could, you could move right. if you had to. Only thing wrong with him is he's follically challenged just like I am this morning. <laughs> so that's it, man. <laughs> all right. So brother Mark is fully functional this morning, but let's just Think about this. What if certain parts of this body start to become unavailable to him? So I got a little something here. This is, uh, this is that shrink wrap stuff. You get it at McNards and you use it to hold things together. Sometimes it is called grandparent babysitting tool. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Now, Brother Mark, would you put out your left hand there and just hold it straight out? That's it. Now, Mark, that thumb, no, no, keep your fingers out. Yeah, that thumb is a valuable tool on your hand, isn't it? Yeah. If, I, if I do that, are you as handy with that hand as you are? Nope. Not quite as handy, are you? I mean, now you can still slap me with it, right? <laughs> you can punch me. And I guess if you had to, you'd grab a fork like that, you know, and you could probably still do. Let's do that to your other hand here. We're going to really limit you a little bit if I can get this thing done. All right, come on now. Mm. That stuff is stuck on there really good. All right, here we go. We're going to get that thumb right there. Go wrap it up. Now, can you still come and go? Yep. Can you talk? Yep. Can you hear? Yep. Can you walk? Yep. You can do all that. All right, very good. Let's see here. Put that arm down just like that right there. <laughs> and uh, what if this part of the body is not available anymore? Keep that other arm up. Keep that one up. All right, put it around. I'm not hugging you. I'm just right doing this illustration here. All right, here we go. All right. Oh. Yep, yep. There we go. We got you right there. Now, he's still got one arm, but is he as effective with one arm as he is with two arms? And even on that arm, he's got this thumb problem. Now, time goes on. He becomes more and more unavailable. And so we just, you know, get this thing. Yep. He can't do much. It's getting worse. This body is just not fully functioning the way that it ought to function at all. So that's what's happening. It could get worse, Brother Mark. I could come right down here and I could say, this, this guy, he just can't go anywhere. He can't, he can't do anything at all. Yep, that thing keeps slipping on me there. All right, you're a slippery sort of a dude. All right, here we go. Yeah, good, right there. Now, if I needed you to take the offering this morning, it'd be a hard thing for you, wouldn't it? It'd be hard. He, he could probably do it. Here, I'm going to see him get down here. 
But it, but are you, do you, would you, would it be better if you had all your functions? Yeah. It would be, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, what if uh, he just, what if his mouth is no longer available? I go to a weird church. <laughs> he, he just, he, he, his mouth is just closed. I'm pulling his hair right out of his face. <laughs> he, his mouth is just closed and he's just not, he's not available to talk about Jesus. He can't go anywhere. He's not doing anything. He can't talk about the Lord. And what if his heart just really grows cold and he just don't want to hear it? How useful, how helpful is his body to him right now? Not much. Man, even eating's gonna be hard. <laughs> now watch. This is hilarious. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make an application real clear in just a minute. Now what needs to happen is they need to set him free, so I just happened to bring a tool. This is my, this is my Tennessee toothpick. <laughs> Now, the Bible says that any branch that bears not fruit, we just do what? We just cut it off. Well, I'm not going to cut it off, but I am going to Now, you hold still, all right? <laughs> and we're, we're going to get him freed up so that he can, he can just get things going. I'm going to let you do your own hands here. All right, let's see. You got that all loose? There you go. I'll clean this up in a minute. We're going to set you completely free here. Oh, we want to take, the, I'll take it real, oh, real slow, all right? Real, real slow. Get those off your head there. Mark is now fully free and functional again. Amen. 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 Very good. Thank you, brother Mark. I appreciate it. Now, that's kind of funny, isn't it? I mean, just laugh about us. It. <laughs> that's funny. That body couldn't do anything. Let me tell you what's not funny. Here's what's not funny. We are the body of Christ. We have a part to play, a gift to employ. We are all very important. And the full function of his body depends upon everything working together. The full function of the body of Christ depends upon every member doing its part. So I want to I wanna plead with you on behalf of, of the Lord Jesus Christ to offer yourself to the body of Christ because in this body, in this location, we can shine forth the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ as each part does its part. Folks, our church experience is more than coming, nodding in agreement, sharing a cup of coffee, shaking a few hands and slapping a few backs and saying, we'll see you same time, same station next week. The body is a, it's a seven day a week opportunity to glorify God. And folks, you are, you say, well, I'm old. Can you pray? You, well, I'm very young. Can you learn and do what you can do? I'm a single mother. Boy, a lot of single mothers need the blessing of a single mother who understands it. I'm just telling you, every part can play a part. Discover your giftedness. Offer it to the body of believers so that Grace Church can shine the light of the gospel with cheerfulness. Father, I pray you'd add your blessing to the preaching. I pray that you would Help us to enjoy the light moments, but to not miss the main teaching. Paul, Paul gave us the illustration. The body works together. Our church can work together. Help us to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.